Yes, I can record. Okay, great. Um, thank you. So, hi and uh, welcome to the second uh, session of the digital demography course. So I I received some very useful feedback yesterday, and I tried to adjust uh, some things, and um, and hopefully it's going to be. Uh, a uh, more uh, rewarding experience for everyone today. Um, so we are, um, so one of the, the things that I changed was, so I added some slides so that we can have more interaction than we had yesterday. And, um, and I would also ask you to, if possible, um, so like the way that we were in, uh, interacting yesterday was this interruption method. So you would just interrupt me. And um, I realized that so that can be uh, a bit difficult to do sometimes. Um, so let's try this method where you can speak at any moment. And if you want, you can interrupt. Uh, but also you can send a chat. And, um, and then I'll, uh, like, uh, I'll let you speak uh, whenever you want. Um, so this like you can either interrupt or you can also send a chat. And then I am also going to ask you to interact uh, in, di in different ways throughout the presentation. So we're going to see uh, how that goes. Um, okay, so what I would like to cover uh, today in this uh, one hour, 20 minutes that we have left is, so first of all, uh, like a brief discussion. If there is something from yesterday uh, that uh, you would like to comment on that wasn't clear. Um, then we're going to speak about uh, crowdsourced data, which is the topic of today. Um, and most, so the, so, and the first half of the lecture, I will try to focus on a general discussion about crowdsourced data, uh, bias, and uh, privacy. And in the second part, we're going to be focusing on a specific type of crowdsource data, which is uh, user-generated family trees. Um, and this idea of limitation and bias is something that is going to, like, uh, we're going to keep coming back to. So, um, does anyone have any uh, thing that they would like to comment about yesterday, and um, also about the course materials and issues that you found? Um, okay, uh, so I hope that we're going to have uh, plenty of opportunity to interact uh, during this this hour. So uh, I'll get started, and uh, please feel free to send a chat or interrupt at any time. Um, so, so the one dynamic that I want to try now is um, so when I ask a question, then you write in the chat. Uh, so like everyone just like writes, in this case, just like one word or a couple of words. So when you think of crowdsourced data, like what is the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, just You can just like, send a message in the chat and everyone will see it. Um, okay, I can, uh, so while you write your uh, answers, I'll just uh, read a couple of them. And uh, what we will do in a later exercise is I'm going to ask specific people to, um, to clarify a bit about, uh, to go a bit more in depth about this, like why they, they said this, why they believe this, if they have examples. Um, so something, some of the messages that are coming in now is, um, I'm going to show them here. So we have uh, lots of people, data from people, contributions to the public, to public to knowledge, data, data about lots of individuals, data generated by individuals, user generated content, big data. 
grassroots data. So there, there seem to be the two understandings here. One is that it's data that is from people. So it's like coming from the grassroots up. Um, also data about lots of people. So like the one thing that, that you all share in these definitions and, and that is correct is that, that the size of this data is generally large. So the other thing is whether it's coming from people or if it is about people. And um, so like we, as we go through the, through the examples, um, we'll see that actually it's, it can be both, right? So like the one key component of crowdsourced data is that it is indeed bottom up, uh, user generated. And it is large, right? So like those two things, like uh, you covered uh, perfectly in your answers. So another thing is like where where it lives. Um, the so one so like one assumption that we can make now is that they are online, and this is correct. Like they uh, they do exist online, but also they can be offline. So like crowdsource data just means like if you pull together resources, um, then you can use this, like the combined efforts of individuals to create information about something. Um, and uh, so in the example that we're gonna see at the end of this, uh, of this lecture uh, on the family trees, the crowdsource genealogies is a good example of how a combination uh, of offline and online resources came together to produce a product that is purely digital and crowdsourced now. Um, we're gonna start now with some online, like purely online examples of uh, crowdsourced data. And um, so, the, and, and we can also distinguish like two different types of crowdsourcing. There is the crowdsourcing that is purposefully crowdsourced. So um, for example, if you ask people actively to engage in an activity, uh, so for example, if you're collecting signatures uh, to support a certain petition, as we're gonna see later, um, then that means that the, uh, so that is like intentionally asking individuals to crowdsource. But more often it's crowdsourcing happens organically and it just so happens that many people uh, start contributing on something and uh, and then we can use the byproducts of this collaboration or our research and the one of the best examples of this is wikipedia where thousands of um, writers contribute and authors create articles and then and then we can also see all the all these combined efforts and uh, and use them for research. So we're gonna see some examples uh, of these two types of uh, crowdsourcing in this in this lecture. But first, I wanted to go back to this graph that we saw yesterday. Um, so this is Twitter users um, and by age and sex, right? So a classic population pyramid. And um, one that illustrates very well the issues that we are facing when we use online data. So just take a look at this pyramid for a second um, and see how the population is distributed in this online, uh, in the sample of uh, online data. And all right, to so look at the differences not only between uh, males and females, but also like in the different age groups. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this on for a second and then Okay, so we're gonna come back to this in a second, to this uh, population pyramid. Um, but before we do, I want to tell you about uh, another study that was 
so this is in the optional uh, reading list. And um, so in this study, Anton and colleagues were comparing different online recruitment platforms uh, for collecting information. So they were looking at uh, Craigslist, um, uh, AdWorks, Google AdWorks, which is like the advertising platform, platform of uh, Google, Facebook and Amazon Mechanical Turk. So for, for those of you who are not familiar, I think most of them you will have heard of, um, maybe except for Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a platform that is mainly used for training data sets uh, that are used for uh, machine learning and labeling uh, and, and labeling this data. Right? So you normally need, and this is work done by people. So you have these mini jobs that you, you say like, oh, I have this task and this is gonna take so many hours and then people, so you offer this job and then people in different parts of the world can accept the job and then they get paid for it. And you get, so it's like the handwork behind the, the whole um, artificial intelligence um, industry. And so they were, using these different um, strategies to recruit iPhone users to fill in a survey. And, um, and they basically distinguish between these two types of uh, ways in which uh, you can recruit uh, people. So the first one they call, they call the pool method. And um, so this is when they advertise, uh, when they got people to fill in the survey using these platforms where uh, you actually paid respondents, right? So cash-based platforms. Um, and uh, of course, like when you did this, they found that the recruits uh, in this platform were uh, more cost efficient and committed to recruiting the, the task, uh, to completing the, the task, sorry. And then the other method was uh, the push method where, so this is based on advertisement. And um, we're gonna see an example of this later. So the idea here is that you don't pay anyone to uh, to fill a survey, but you pay the provider of the advertising platform to advertise your survey, and then users are served the the, the survey as, as as an ad that you see in the timeline on Facebook or in Google. Um, and then they found that when they did that, there was not so much efficiency and commitment but they recruited a more demographically diverse pool of respondents, right? So you have this like uh, different uh, pros and cons uh, when for using both platforms. And, um, and then we're gonna see some results, but before that, so this is one of the new slides where there, um, so I have pre prepared these three questions um and i would ask you to think about them um so i'm gonna give you a couple of minutes write them in the chat and then uh, i'm gonna ask some of you to elaborate a bit on your answers and right, so based on what we have discussed so far what would you say are some possible challenges um for uh, when you're using this crowdsourced data. And the second question, um, sorry, so there was a mistake here. Uh, the second question is how can um, crowdsource a related question? How is it that crowdsourcing can bias the data collection? And what are some privacy considerations? All right, so you can, you can pick one of these three questions uh, to focus on, like you don't need to answer uh, all three of them. Uh, just pick one and take five minutes, uh, come up with uh, an answer that you can then summarize and send to the chat. Uh, and then I'm gonna um, ask some of you to, to elaborate a bit more. So it's 11.52 here, um, so let's say, I, I can check with you at 11.55, uh, see how you're doing. And, um, and, as, and when you're ready, just uh, send, your, send your answer to the chat.
Okay, so there's a lot um, about the selection effects uh, in terms of uh, socioeconomic status, um, in terms of age also of the users. Um, Okay, so uh, men and young people will be overrepresented among grassroots users, and uh, we can think, think a bit uh, about why this is the case. Um, So, so there's a lot of messages coming in about the demographics of users being different, but also in terms of what we think of as age, sex structure, but also in relation to power and advantage. Um, Exactly. Yes. So um, Ilgi also mentioning that the some users might have a. So there's also another type of selection effect when we think of surveys, uh, where it's only those people who have the strongest opinion and the more extreme views, perhaps that can uh, that are going to answer this this surveys. And this is something that has been spoken about a lot when we think of the way that uh, social media serves as content. Okay, so Heiner, some uh, uh, bringing up the issue of privacy also that maybe uh, and consent, maybe users are not necessarily informed about the uh, the aims of the research, and we're we're gonna discuss this briefly. Um, okay, so I'm gonna wait uh, for Miguel to stop typing, and then um, I'm gonna ask some of you to share their views. So no. Yeah, and there's also bots, uh, which is, is another issue, uh, another big source of bias that is very difficult uh, to detect. Uh, yeah. Okay, so in the meantime, I'm gonna go back to the presentation and uh, to the presentation and so, um, okay. <laughs> so now we have found uh, a way to randomly pick people and uh, make sure that there is uh, that they're not that, that they're only going to be called uh, once. So now we have uh, selected three people from the group uh, who, like very briefly, uh, are going to explain uh, the reason behind their choice of uh, potential challenge of the crowdsource data. So maybe we start with Haina. From the slide, from the population slide, uh, you showed earlier, it seems that uh, among Twitter users, uh, younger people and men were overrepresented. So I'm just generalized this to all uh, crowdsourcing data that this is also the group that will that you will get if you use uh, crowdsourced data. And in terms of uh, <coughs> privacy, uh, thinking about the readings that you <coughs> circulated for today, uh, people, they are giving into these uh, genealogy websites, they give the information about their family and they don't necessarily know that this uh, content is used for other purposes. So I see some uh, ethical concern here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Uh, Chi, do you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, I also checked the discussions and as Miguel mentioned, the young people um, they, they use uh, social media. Uh, uh, I mean, they, uh, 
most of the young people use social media, but I also think uh, in terms of different social media like Twitter and Facebook, uh, they may change, for example, uh, uh, in, uh, maybe at the beginning, uh, uh, most of young people use Facebook, but later uh, the old people prefer to use Facebook and young people decided to, to use another social media like Instagram and other type of social media. And also I think uh, this can also create some bias when we use this type of data. Yeah, uh, so we call this, uh, um, thank you, Chi. So I, I don't know if you remember, but yesterday we, so does anyone remember how we called this phenomenon yesterday? Of the population changing over time? So uh, Matthew's Organic called it population drift. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly, so drifting, um, and this is a major concern. Yeah. Um, Anna, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I was thinking about um, like a people who will fill the questionnaires or survey or whatever will maybe have more stronger opinion than the rest of the population. Like if that is something which is uh, which they can connect to, uh, they will like to share the, their opinion through the survey. Why? While the other people just don't care that much, so they will not. Mm -hmm. And do you think is it this is, is it likely that this like opinions will will be linked to the demographic characteristics of people? Well, I think they might be um, depending on what you are asking. Um, like for um, uh, younger people, it's harder to connect with some topics. Like, I don't know, um, having children in future, like if you are 15, you're most likely not, or you have different, like less opinions about uh, raising kids, having children, stuff like that. I don't know, it's just example. So that can be connected with demography. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thanks. And so Marilina, you think that it may be linked to social desirability in, in which in which way? Uh, I, this was connected to what Anna was saying that maybe uh, people are more inclined to express their views if they feel that other people would approve of this. I was thinking of the um, uh, silence spiral, or I don't remember exactly the the English name, in which precisely this people who are have stronger opinions would. Uh, who have uh, who think that other people are more in agreement with their opinions would be more likely to maybe express them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, the so like something else that the online surveys do, for example, um, and that some would argue that uh, helps in reducing the social desirability bias is that you remove the person-to-person -person interaction. Um, so it's no longer a person going to your house or calling you to ask you questions, but you are assured anonymity when answering a survey uh, and you're not in contact with anyone. It doesn't mean that that, that completely eliminates uh, this bias, um, but it's interesting to think how it, it just reconfigures it as opposed to real world uh, surveys. We're gonna move on. Um, just feel free to interrupt at any moment. So these are some results from the from this study uh, comparing recruitment pl platforms. So the benchmark bars are um, so what they were aiming for, and then you can see how different platforms uh, vary in terms of the of who they get. Um, so we see Mechanical Turk, uh, not necessarily more men. Um, and the same for Craigslist. So many more women filling in the survey, but of course the, the sample sizes are very different. Also Craigslist, we have 300 people. Um, to see like the demographics also vary, of the users vary by platform. Um, so now if we look at the 
uh, age distribution. Uh, so this is what you were saying. So very young population, uh, very much underrepresented in the older age groups. Um, yeah, particularly in MTER and Craigslist. Um, so when they were paying uh, for uh, for people to fill in the surveys, but when using the ad works, so when serving the survey through ads, then uh, you get relatively more uh, balanced uh, age distribution in this case. So this is an example that is uh, a bit closer to home. Um, this is a survey that some colleagues uh, in uh, my lab of digital demography are conducting at the moment to understand uh, some of the attitudes uh, around the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And um, so I would encourage you very much to go to this link. Uh, so this is the website um, of the of the survey. And there, uh, well, you can see the way that it's set up. You can see a screenshot here. And uh, if you like the page, then there um, there is a chance that you will, so you're more likely to be shown this so there is no link to go to the survey directly, but you have to be recruited through the advertisement platform. And so if you try that, then maybe in a couple of days, you will see an ad where you're invited to join the survey. So, okay, so, so we're gonna, we're gonna discuss um, some of the issues uh, on addressing bias, but before we do, I want to discuss another study um, which uses a uh, post certification method. So, so now we are at the point where we know that the data uh, is biased. That's, but we want to see, we want to find out if there is a way in which we can address this bias. Um, so, here, this is a study where they were trying to forecast uh, elections using a non-representative sample from surveys conducted in Xbox. So, you know, like the gaming platform. And then of course, the population that uses Xbox is not, is not representative of the national US population in this case. And, um, and here we can see a bit in these graphs, the way in which they were not uh, necessarily representative. Um, so the Xbox population, uh, much more male uh, and um, also younger and uh, more white. So, so especially those three uh, showed this at large uh, divergence. And um, right, so and then what they do is, uh, so, so the basic underlying idea of post certification that we will get back to uh, in a bit is so you can, if you know the degree, if you split your sample in different cells. So the easiest way to think about this, uh, so they do something more complicated here, but it's just by age and sex and race, say. So if you know the degree to which your sample is underrepresenting these three characteristics, then you can adjust, so you can apply weights after you have conducted your survey, and the weights will in some way be derived from the underrepresentation of these cells that you define. And so we know to which degree men uh, and like black men of older ages are underrepresented. So we can use that to derive a weight that then we will apply to our outcomes, and then that will help us. Um, estimate some outcome. In this case, uh, so the probability that Obama uh, would win. So here you can see like the, the dotted line being the prediction from other sources, so market, um, so betting, betting agencies and so, compared to the Xbox prediction. So like in this case, they're like, they fit quite well. And this is, so this is a good paper, I think, uh, to start thinking of these ways in which we can address bias. Um, okay, so I mentioned Wikipedia, and um, so this is uh, also one of the optional readings in which they were trying to predict the revenue of films uh, by looking at the 
edits of the pages that refer to the films. Right? So the idea was that you can build a model depending where your main explanatory variable is uh, activity in Wikipedia, and that would help you predict how much revenue uh, a film, uh, the, the revenue of, of a film when released. Right, so the line, so they, they claim to have made a, quite a good prediction. But so one thing that is important to keep in mind uh, when, we, when we think of this is, so the old saying that is very difficult to make predictions, especially, uh, right, so there was a problem with the audio. Um, um, but what I was saying from here was that they they were uh, trying to make these predictions from the edit, and they claim in this paper uh, that their model uh, works and predicts uh, predicted the revenue pretty well uh, just by looking at the edits. And so, but like when we look at the thing, it's important to keep in mind that it's difficult to predict, and especially when it's about the future. Um, so, like, there are many papers that claim to have predicted things post facto. Right? So, like, this is also called post fiction. So, it's easier if, like, you already know the outcome to build a model that will predict that outcome than if you don't know the outcome. So, that's why forecasting uh, continues to be very difficult, uh, even when we have this kind of information. Um, so, so these are the last slides of this first part of the session. So I want us to take a break also. Um, but before we do, we are going to look at another uh, way of looking that online activ crowdsourced activity has been uh, studied. So this is from Taha Yasseri. And this is basically the, he was looking at online petitions in the UK Parliament website. So you can, people can open, uh, can start petitions and then collect signatures. Um, and uh, so he found this pattern where there seems to be this exponential growth in the number of signatures that is uh, collected. And that is a function of time. So very few signatures in, in a short time after the petition is released, uh, you collect many signatures and then this levels off. So you end up having this kind of logistic curve. Um, and this is something that you see over and over again. Right, so this is an example of using um, crowdsourced data, the pipe product. Um, to to analyze online behavior, uh, which should give us a better understanding about how these data are created. Um, right. I think uh, someone has their microphone not muted. So if you could just check that your mic is Sorry, that was me. Um, okay, so, and this is um, an example from real life. So we are uh, currently collecting signatures for a statement about the, some measures that we think need to be taken in Latin America um, in the context of the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And so this is just a graph of the number of signatures that we have been collecting over the last two days, three days. And you can see like there's this similar pattern where like many signatures were collected uh, in a short time and then like kind of levels off. Um, if you wanna contribute to this curve, you can follow the link uh, at the bottom and uh, add your signature. So, right, okay, so before we go uh, to the break, uh, I would like to repeat this exercise that we did before uh, with the questions where you just take a couple of minutes to think about ways in which you could, if you had to, how you would use, how you could use crowdsourcing for your own research. And uh, these are three things that you can uh, focus on, like which platform you would use, 
what are some of the challenges to see and if you would take any special measure uh, regarding privacy. Uh, so a couple of minutes, just write answers uh, as you uh, think of them in the chat, and then we're gonna take a, a break. I'm going to leave this uh, for a bit longer. Okay, so uh, we have some answers coming in. Um, so Momo would be interested in online dating platforms. Um, yes, so I think that's also very, I'm also interested in online dating platforms. Uh, can be a bit difficult to access the data. So um, we're gonna speak about this tomorrow, but uh, Access is, uh, can be an issue. Um, Facebook, uh, because it's very large. Um, of course, there are challenges of representativeness um, and the, about how we inform of, of the aims of our study. Um, so while uh, you write, I'm just gonna show you something. So we can see actually an example of how colleagues at uh, our lab are doing this, where they are actually informing about the aims of the research. So this is the website of the survey. And uh, 
Yes. So, for example, in the here in the website, there are, there are these posts where the health behavior survey page is uh, has. So they wrote an article in the website of the institute, and there's a link to it, and then gives the names of the scientists, and here they explain why they are doing it, uh, what kind of information they're collecting. So this is a way where, like, if you have a a page you can use it to inform about the aims of the research. Um, okay, study health effects. Lara would use a survey uh, in Facebook or Instagram. Okay, um, so in the interest of time, uh, so do please continue writing. Um, but we're gonna, I'm gonna ask some of you maybe to say a bit more about what they're thinking. And uh, I hope that it's the people who have already written something. But, okay, great. So now we take out three more people from our uh, virtual hat. And uh, Momo, do you wanna start? Sure, so I mentioned that I would use an online dating platform because I, I think that's, that's all I could think of, honestly, to look at partnership. <laughs> and the, what was the question? The bias or something? Yeah. The shortcoming would be that, of course, it's um, already selected by people that are using like uh, online platforms in general. And then you have then people that, you know, um, maybe people that can't find relationships in the real world that select into then going online or people that are looking for a certain kind of relationship that are online. Um, so that's the selection part. And then. To protect privacy, I, I was just thinking to use fake names or kind of change or make things different from what they are that wouldn't change or affect my outcome in a way. I, I wasn't sure if I could change the place they're from or something and that would affect it or something like that. Just change stuff that um, would protect their privacy but not really interfere with what I'm trying to study, I guess. Okay, yeah, that's very interesting. And I think we can yeah, speak a lot about this. So there's like an issue of like the privacy of users, like they can be like you, there is an obligation to protect it when you share it, but there's also the part of privacy where like you are looking at that data as a researcher. It can can be very sensitive, especially if if users didn't agree to that. Uh, or maybe you just receive aggregated data yourself, so there is no microdata that you can mm -hmm. actually. Um, so we're gonna do one more of this, and then we're gonna go to the break. Uh, Alexander, are you? Okay, okay, maybe if you're ready. I, I can try. Right. I study high-skilled high migration, and I think that uh, the power of the crowd in this case can help to better understand what is really happening to these migrants and how, for example, the government and different organizations can help them, for example, to return. I mean, those uh, who have emigrated but ready to come back and uh, we can identify what conditions should be created and other issues. And in this case, I think crowdsourcing can be really useful and what about protection privacy i think the same or just use aggregated data or by hiding maybe the real names or something like that so the so i so what, which, which kind of platforms could you envision that could produce this type of data that you would need uh, I think different service data. 
So like using ads or something to recruit participants? Okay. Why not? All right, thanks. Uh, so maybe just last. Uh, so Ilga, you have all already done some online survey um, of Syrians in Turkey. So it's also like related to migration. And uh, so could you like share a bit about that experience? Yeah, sure. Um, so we did a survey. It was a Canadian company who was doing it for everyone all around the world. Because in Turkey, we are not allowed to do surveys on integration. So we use this method. And then whenever people did some typos while entering Facebook or Google, our survey would appear and then they would have to choose a language, either Turkish or Arabic. And then we would ask questions about integration of Syrians to Turkish people and Syrian people. But the results were quite interesting because we had a lot of angry Turkish people who responded, like a lot of swear words or really Turkish people who were really supporting Syrians. And so there was no in between people who actually completed the survey because we only used the completed surveys. And then there was a lot of not completed survey. They just quit the survey after second or third question. And for Syrians, we had the problem of obviously only educated men who had access to internet were able to answer. So we, I think we had like 1000 men and not even 100 women who responded to the survey. So I think it was a little bit biased, but still it gave some opinion about the integration and social cohesion of Syrians in Turkey, but with a lot of limitations. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One of the assumptions of things like the post ratification method is that there is a signal that is weak, but it's still there of the group that we're interested in. But it can be like the group is simply not represented, but then it's like multiplying by zero. So you, you can't get anything. Um, so thank you very much for the discussion. Uh, we're going to take five minutes now, so half past. Uh, so you can just stretch a bit, rest your eyes, and, um, and then we're going to continue with the second part of the presentation.
All right, hi everyone. Um, so we're gonna continue with the second part of uh, of our session today. And so in this part, I wanna go a bit more in depth uh, and discuss the one type of crowdsource data, uh, which is also the data that you will be using for the assignment. Uh, so I think it makes sense to, to do this now. The so like what what is a genealogy? It is the history of a population, or rather, it uh, includes the history of population. So this is a family tree, uh, starting with William the Conqueror, uh, um, that comes from Jenny.com. So Jenny.com is ultimately where the profiles were created of um, for the exercise that we you, that you're gonna do in the assignment. Um, so this goes way back. Uh, in the 11th century, um, so like that's also good to know. Like most people in these genealogies are already dead, um, by far. Um, so like, which also like leads us to think in a different way about privacy. Um, so users are alive, but not necessarily the people on whom they report. Uh, and this is kind of a an interesting dilemma to think about. Uh, so so there, there were two readings for today. Uh, one of them was using this data from Families, uh, the one by Kaplanis. And then the other one is this one, Fire and Elovici, who use data from another website called Wikitree. Um, and the idea is very similar. Uh, the difference is that one, the Kaplanis one, they are insiders. So they are uh, working in the inside of this company. And, um, and the FIRE study of Wikitree, they are scraping the data from Wikitree. Right? So like two different approaches to get at uh, similar data. So this is also something that, so this comes from this paper and it's something very common, I think, when we have this kind of large data sets that we get these kind of visualizations, which like I think it looks very nice, but I'm not sure what what it conveys. Like apart from the fact that it's a network, so here like you have individuals uh, connected by family ties, but like what do we get to learn about this about this network when we look at this colorful visualization, right? So it's, I, I think especially with networks, it's very difficult, like when you visualize it, like we are not told what colors are uh, or like what the position of the nodes is probably like an algorithm generating this. Um, but the graph, I think the, the paper has like some more illustrative uh, figures. And um, so this is one, right? So they take the family trees and then uh, based on that, they do something that is very similar to the exercise which is they estimate the lifespan variation in the world, right? So they say like uh, different colors are different cohorts. So like different cohorts of people, like you can see how lifespan uh, variation has changed uh, over time. And um, so what you see in the, in the y-axis, so this is the so you can see like the age at which a different percentage of the profiles have died. So they, they, they show here a shift to like uh, ages happening, uh, death happening at older ages for more recent cohorts, right? So you can see like the graph is like shifting a bit to the right. But th so this is something that we, okay. And you, and you see it more clearly in the inset plot in the top, right? So they say, this is the world and now, this one is the United States. And like, to be honest, it's kind of difficult to see like exactly what the difference is uh, between these two. And it, it doesn't, so th this doesn't mean that there is like the world is the same as the United States, right? So there is probably something happening with the sample where the United States, it just happens to be overrepresented in the sample to the sense that, 
So when they make these claims like, oh, like we now look at the world, we now look at the USA, maybe when we focus on this type of data, it's like there is not so much difference. And um, so this is something that is not clearly uh, discussed in the paper, but that we, um, that when we work with this kind of information, uh, is it's important to acknowledge. All right, so we're gonna look a bit more in into how like some potential issues uh, with the data. So this is the profile from Jenny uh, of William the Conqueror that I that I showed before, and so like one potential issue uh, that we can find in these genealogies is that so there are many bias. Uh, biases, like one particular one that we can think of is, so it's not, so I think there is not a name for this bias, but I as have started calling it this William the Conqueror bias, which is that, so like everybody wants to be related to famous people. Um, so it's some kind of desirability bias, but it's more like maybe the motivation of many people who create genealogies is is to find that they are actually, you know, the descendant of like the queen or something. Uh, so, so there is this phenomenon where like maybe you have that this like these famous people have more connections than than they would that they actually had, you know, like many more descendants that like they did in biological terms, and uh, and it can be a bit tricky to find this um, exactly how this uh, plays out, and. So this is uh, so this genealogical data is so basically the way it works is users is like a Facebook for genealogists. So you create a profile and uh, and then you start with like this is me, these are my parents, these are my grandparents, and then you can link these records to records from other people. Um, there's some automatic linkage also going on. So it's like thousands of people who are creating their own family trees, and then you merge them and you create this large network. Um, and now, uh, this is also uh, with my heritage, which is kind of sister company of Jenny. You can also do your DNA test. Uh, and when you do your DNA test, then you get this ethnicity estimate where it's like, oh, this is like where you come from, uh, which is, uh, has many issues in itself. Um, but then the interesting thing is that because you're providing this DNA data, then you're also given suggestions uh, about like, oh, look, this is your cousin. Like, do you want to connect them in your genealogy, right? So like, that's another way in which like, you integrate these genealogies. And this, this DNA data is not publicly available uh, because of uh, privacy and security reasons, um, but a, an anonymized version of the genealogies is, which is what uh, you have in the assignment. So this family links data, um, their initial goal was to register the entire population of the world. So they wanted to create this uh, family tree that includes every person who has ever lived. Mm. They're not quite there yet, but they have 86 million profiles uh, covered the last 400 years. And, um, and this has been curated. Uh, so they assure us, as you read in the article, that they like, did some quality checks. And um, of the geocoded events, we know that 55% are in Europe, 30 in North America. So it is a very biased sample. It, there is uh, nothing for East Asia, for example. Um, so this is like a history of the West. Um, also Latin America, there's not much. So, so you can see here uh, where um, like people were reported as having been born. Um, so it's like mainly US um, and Europe, right? So there are like some people in Latin America, South Africa, India, like probably reported by someone in Europe. Uh, so this is, so, th so it's important to understand this bias. Um, if you just look at the last 200 years, uh, so this is the population by age uh, and sex, according to the genealogies. So one thing that um, should uh, become evident now is uh, this difference um, between 
female and male, right? So more men uh, in the data. And this is something that, that we are gonna see now also in a second. So this is male to female ratio. Uh, the um, solid line is, um, is the families data and the dotted line is the real data from the human mortality database. Uh, so one value of one means that they're same number of uh, men as women. Um, and we see that actually, so it's kind of opposite to what we would expect. So um, whereas there were normally the male to female ratio is uh, less than one in the real population, we see it being higher uh, than one in the family links population. So we are overestimating men historically. Okay, so now we're gonna do the last of this uh, participation exercises. Um, just brainstorming. Why do you think there are so many men in the genealogies? Is there a way of fixing this? And like, what, would, what kind of data do we need to fix this? Um, so just like write your ideas in the chat and then we're gonna call out some people. And uh, so that you can start getting your answer, answers ready. So I would say maybe um, we can leave Ilgi out now uh, because he already had uh, uh, some participation in the last activity. So we start with Daniel and uh, Lara. But uh, I'll give you one, it's a bit more time to 
think about your answers. Diego, could you show the slides again? Uh, because I missed the last question. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's see. So we have some uh, answers already. It's thinking about uh, who is remembered and who is not. Mm -hmm. Some like gender preferences also in like Do how we choose to remember. Sorry? Do you want us to start? Um, I would Daniel say we can uh, maybe start uh, with Daniel. Okay. Uh, Daniel, do you want to start? I think they're having microphone issues. Okay, uh, then maybe you can start, Lara. Uh, okay, um, I thought there might be so many men, especially when we go back in the centuries, that um, in the private family genealogical information that only the men were reported. Um, because I remember that we have some of those old books uh, in my dad's family as well. And in some centuries, there were only the man, uh, the names of the men reported. So maybe that's why the information is not complete. And also, maybe it's, again, like an access problem or a problem of interest that um, that's just speculation now, that men are more interested in filling up those information online. And that's why um, the information are maybe on men, but that's really just speculation. And I was thinking of fixing this using a historical census data, maybe, just to see whether there are matches and how the uh, pro gender proportions have been in yeah, certain countries in the years. And yeah, that's my thoughts about that so far. OK, yeah, yeah that's great. We're going like, to unpack some of these things uh, in a second. So do you want to try now? Um, okay, so I think it's probably not working. Um, okay, so we, let's see if people have uh, written so far. So Margarita, do you have anything to add? Um, I'm not sure, uh, as I was writing before. I was thinking uh, what we were saying before about the social basic measurability. So maybe, I don't know, people tend to uh, want to be related to someone famous and maybe there was mostly men. Um, and I, I don't know what that thought. Yeah. So I think, so maybe we can finish this uh, with Andres. You seem to have uh, many possible explanations. Yeah, well, I just uh, mentioned that uh, probably men, because I, if I understood correctly, this data is collected like in the present. So maybe men are more likely to care about their, their past and how they have novels and sisters. Um, so that was a hypothesis. I thought you could adjust this by 
you know, if, if you are interested in the quantity, just in the quantity of women, then you can adjust the number of women by multiplying by a, by a factor. And I thought you could get this number by looking at the oldest possible record of the male to female ratio by age. Mm -hmm. I okay. don't know if that makes sense, uh, but yeah. Yeah, that makes total sense. And uh, so this is, so if we go back. Can I also add something? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, was it Lara? Um, Madalina, I just wanted to say that um, perhaps data doesn't only come from birth and death records, and when these are not found, uh, men are more likely to have other kinds of records, such as by owning property or trading or different um, kind of roles assumed that maybe women did not have access to. And then maybe this could also be a reason why there is less data on women. Mm -hmm. So, so I think this is like a nice example of how, like, just to repeat what you have already said, but like our modern fancy data collection tools just reinforce biases that already exist and that can be very old. Maybe just women were not recorded as often as, as men. Um, um, and, uh, and maybe this is something that like lingers over, over generations and also affects the way we recall, uh, those who lived before, before us in previous generations. Um, so another interesting thing, so we need, so in order to understand these biases in this data set and in internet data sets in general, we need to understand the data generating process to the extent that is possible. And um, so like one question here for our uh, discussion of genealogies is who is creating these profiles? Uh, so this is, um, so I created this looking at the, um, so there's an API also for this website where you can see who is actually the creator of the profiles. And you see that there is this power law distribution where like it's a very small number of genealogies that create most of the profiles, right? So it's like in the hundreds. Uh, and these people are the ones who are creating hundreds of profiles. Uh, so like, it would be interesting to know uh, because their biases are going to determine to a large extent the ones of the data in general. And this is not something that is unique to this data set, but like we see this distribution. Uh, you sh it's very common in crowdsourcing. Uh, so it's usually like a small number of users who are going to be the super users who have a disproportionate uh, influence on the general in, on the final outcome. Um, so this is a closer look at the data generating process. Um, so um, an API uh, is an interface that is. Uh, made available by a service that allows you to interact with the services provided by that platform in a programmatic way. Um, so usually you can do like similar things uh, by hand or you can do them using an API. Um, so in this case, um, you could either go to the website and download manually, like, oh, this is like, this user has this information and then you can like copy and paste it. Or you can just write a script that will send a uh, hundred requests in one hour and then you will get like a data set back. So it's an automated way of interacting with the services provided by a platform. Um, so, uh, so here you can see like what the data generating process actually looks like. This is a conference of genealogists uh, and like so many things. So I, I attended this conference uh, and like many things uh, stand out. Uh, it's pretty um, uh, elderly population, like my guess, median age 65 and, um, and it's mainly men. So like this is not a representative uh, like uh, estimation, but uh, not far from the truth, maybe. Uh, 
Okay, so we, we, we only have a couple of minutes left. So I'm going to um, focus on what I am um, mostly interested in now, which is the data that we're going to be using for our project. Um, so this is, so we are going to take this massive data set and I gave you already only a sample, so a subset of this data, which is what you can see in this graph. Um, is this graph more useful than the one I criticized before? Uh, I hope so. It, it shows how our data that we're sharing is only a small part of the larger uh, data set. Um, so it, it's only about Sweden. Right? And the way, so if you have uh, had the time to look at this, the way that this is uh, organized is there are columns. So each row is one person. And then you get the date of birth and the date of death of the person. Um, Someone who doesn't have a value for birth or death is because we don't know it. Uh, in some cases, because they're still alive, they don't have a death year. But in most cases, they will have already died, right? So like in the exercise, you're also going to have to find a way of dealing with this missing data. And then we have a column that tells us who the father and who the mother is of each person. Right? So each row, one individual person with a unique profile ID, and then this uh, father and mother column tells us who the father and who the mother is of each person. Right, so this is the data that, that you're going to be using. Um, and uh, so, so this is in Sweden, and like our sample corresponds roughly to like what we know about where the human settlements in historical Sweden. Also, so this guy, I think, for Sweden is quite good. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to stop here. Um, I'm not going to cover this last part uh, because I want to speak a bit about the, the homework. So uh, things um, I suggest that you do uh, today in preparation for tomorrow's class. Um, so there is a link of uh, Sophia Hill, is a PhD student in our lab. And she has prepared a tutorial for using the Facebook marketing API, right? So if you are interested in uh, APIs and if you're interested in using Facebook data, this is a very good start. It's um, using R and um, you can access it. It's uh, freely available. So we're, like, we're not going to discuss it in depth, but it's a good resource. Um, and then the, so there's a paper tomorrow uh, on the digital gender gaps. So as you read that paper, I would encourage you to also check out this website, which is like the online companion uh, to the reading. And um, if you haven't done so, I would recommend that you start working on, on the exercise one. Um, and that is, uh, so that's all from my side. Now we have um, a couple of minutes. If you also want to add something, you can just uh, say it or write that. Uh, in the chat. So the, the part that we, uh, so I left out a couple of slides. We could come back to those in the last session. Um, but they were basically answering of like uh, how we can use this idea of post stratification um, for applying weights to the estimates from the genealogies so that we can get um, like uh, some estimates that are real or closer to reality. So I had a couple of technical notes. Yeah. I have a question about an article that you recommended. Uh, the yeah. Kaplani set and colleagues one. Um, so there, there are quite a lot of new terms there, but I didn't really understand what the additive component was that they were estimating. Was it a um, uh, correlation between longevity of different cohorts or I didn't really understand what that was about? Yeah. So I, think I mean, it is... was about genes and something with dominant and something genes, yeah. Yeah, so I would say that this, so I'm not 
like 100%. I think you're referring to a specific analysis that I can't recall, uh, to be honest. But so what I, what I would say about this is like, I think it's very interesting for us as demographers because this was, this is written very much in the language of computer science article. The period that I mentioned last time where like we have an interesting data set and, and that is the motivation for this article. You know, that the data set is interesting and like look at all these different things we can do with it. But like, we don't really go in depth uh, into any of these things. Um, but only like show like kind of this in a quick way how, how we can look at lifespan we can look at migration we can do like all these different things um but don't really like like focus on on anything uh like that we would probably not do as uh, social researchers ah. okay thanks nice picture Miguel. Okay, any other uh, comment or, or question? Um, okay, so we, we are, like, um, we have come to the end of this uh, second session. So thank you again for joining me and uh, please feel free to email me if you wanna discuss something. And, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow.